بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone here. Um, thank your community for inviting me out here, especially uh, my dear brother and my respected elder and a mentor of mine, Sheikh Muhammad Thaqir. Uh, and uh, people often say, I don't say this about myself, but people say that this is uh, one of the cool sheikhs, or they tell me, you don't look like a sheikh. And I usually tell people, if you want to see a real cool sheikh, an inside out cool sheikh, then you have to uh, go talk to Sheikh Muhammad Fakir. Um, <coughs> anyway, the sheikh said uh, we're going to have questions today. Is this too loud? Is this really loud? I feel like it's really loud. Okay. Also, this is one of the only communities that, um, in which I feel like I'm in a sci fi movie because of the headset. So, <laughs> so the topic uh, is actually the topic, the broader topic is the night and how the night relates to a believer. Uh, one of the amazing things about uh, the night time is that the night time is very special whether you're a believer or not. One of the things that psychologists often discuss is that um, nights are usually uh, considered a spiritual time. So they talk about how usually people are more willing to share uh, and they're usually more in touch with their feelings and their emotions at night. And this is why you see uh, when people go out on dates and stuff like that, when, are, when do they usually go out? During the day or at night? So I usually people go out on dates uh, at nighttime and even like um, Valentine's Day. During the day, everyone's busy trying to buy gifts and everything like that, but all the dates are at night. Um, so people are more likely to be in touch with their spiritual side uh, and their feelings and their emotions. And what Islam does is that it takes advantage of this time. So while other people are busy doing every, every other things, uh, a believer takes that spiritual time and they take that emotional time and they devote it to their Lord. And one of the things that the scholars often talk about is that the night is a testimony of a person's love. So whatever a person loves, you'll see that they'll usually devote their night to that. So if a person's only concern in life is to have fun and party and maximize pleasure, they'll spend their night trying to do that. If a person's concern is their afterlife, and their love for Allah, then they will spend their night in concern about their akhirah. And they'll spend their night devoted to Allah Azza wa Jal. As Allah Azza wa Jal وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ That those who believe, they're stronger in their love for uh, Allah Azza wa Jal. Imam Hassan al-Basri, and I, I often quote Imam Hassan al-Basri because uh, he was one of, he was in the uh, second generation, one of the uh, tabi'een. And he was in touch very much with our spiritual side. And I think if his words are applied to our times, there's a lot for us to learn. So this Imam Hassan Basri, uh, is one of the great Imams, uh, he was asked by some people, they said, why is it that we can't bring ourselves to pray Qiyam al-Layl? So they said to him that we try so hard to get up in the night and pray to Allah, but it's really difficult for us to pray. And the Imam said that it is your sins or your desires that have kept you or that have restrained you from getting up uh, in the night. Now, um, oftentimes people talk about the bare minimum, and they talk about, you know, us as Muslims in the West, a lot of times we are told that the very least that we can do is just do the bare minimum, meaning we have to just survive in the West, meaning as long as we are at least praying our five daily prayers, we're doing okay. And I, would tonight, want to present to you a different theory. That our salvation doesn't lie, meaning if you want to become better Muslims, if you want to be um, better parts of society, we, don't, we shouldn't just do the bare minimum. Rather, it's when we go above and beyond that we're going to find our salvation. And this is what you see in the, in the early generations, uh, the companions, for example, that when they were presented with the extra actions, the actions that went above the bare minimum, this is what made them special. And to say that the companions, Allah ta'ala anhum, uh, didn't make a huge journey in their spirituality and, and their connection with Allah is not true. I mean, if you look at the Jahili Arabs and the state that they were, in, they were in, they were in a far worse state than a lot of us. So I present to you tonight that if we're really looking to become better Muslims, we're looking to improve our relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, it will lie in things like Qiyam al the extra acts. So if we strive to do the extra acts, it is in those acts that we're going to find that our spirituality will increase. 
and we'll become better Muslims and we'll find that connection uh, with Allah Azza wa Jal. And we go back to the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and we see how he treated Qiyamul Layl. And the Prophet ﷺ, first of all, he told us that after the five mandatory prayers, meaning after our five daily prayers, the best, the best prayer for us is the night prayer. So if we're looking to improve our, our spiritual nature and we're looking to become better Muslims, after the five daily prayers, where do we turn? The night. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, if you look at his Sunnah, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she tells us about one of her nights with the Prophet sallallahu She says that the Prophet ﷺ was sleeping uh, next to her and he got up in the middle of the night and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says to the Prophet ﷺ, she says, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to worship my Lord. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says, Wallahi ya Rasulullah, I would love that you sleep next to me, but I will not keep you from going to worship your Lord. And then she says, the Prophet ﷺ got up, he made wudu and he started praying. And when going into sujood or such or prostration, the Prophet ﷺ, he would tap the feet of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and she would pull her feet in. Do you know why he would tap her feet and why she would have to pull them in? Because the apartment of Aisha, the quarters of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, were that small. Some scholars even say it was four feet by six feet. That was the apartment of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. But this was the, the spiritual nature uh, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And we know that the Prophet sallam, he would pray so much qiyam, he would spend so much time in prayer at the night that his feet would swell. And this was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And when he was asked that why is it that you do this, why do you put yourself through such uh, hardship and cause yourself so much pain when your sins have been forgiven? The Prophet sallam, his sins were, were forgiven by Allah azza wa jal. And he says, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا shakura." So shouldn't I be a grateful servant to Allah Azza wa Jal? And this is the same teaching that the Prophet ﷺ conveyed to the companions. The Prophet ﷺ would walk the, the streets of Medina at night. And it is said that he would go to the house of Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, And he would hear Abu Bakr praying Qiyamul Layl. But Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an, he would recite in a very low voice. And then he would go to the house of Umar. And he would hear Umar reciting praying Qiyamul Layl. So he would then say to, um, to, to Abu Bakr, he would say, Ya Abu, ya Abu Bakr, raise your voice. And then go, he would go to Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, and he would say, Ya Umar, lower your voice. So what we get from this story is, number one, the companions, what they did during their nights. They spent their nights in worship. The second thing that we understand from this is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught the companions how to be good Muslims. Meaning it wasn't just about you know, the mandatory acts, the Prophet ﷺ trained them in becoming good Muslims. And part of that training, part of that, that school that the Prophet ﷺ established was teaching them the importance of Qiyamul Layl. And Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an, we know that it is said about him that he would spend the whole night in Qiyam. And this is something that I know a lot of us, we, we find strange. We find strange that how could somebody spend the night in Qiyamul Layl. And the reason is that Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an found sweetness and enjoyment in the Qiyam more than any other thing in life. So while we find enjoyment or, or, or we enjoy sleeping or rest, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an at times would pray the whole night because it is in that which uh, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an uh, found enjoyment. It's no secret, it's no surprise that uh, our ummah today, our nation today, is not doing too well. And I hate to be negative, I hate to be you know, negative about issues, but this is just a reality. And the point isn't for us to become depressed and say we're a goner and there's nothing we can do. The point is how do we bring ourselves out of this situation and how do we become like the companions of the Allah ta'ala anhum. And this is why one of the things that is often said by the classical scholars and even scholars of our time is that if we want to rectify this ummah, if we, want to ch if we really, really care about this ummah, we really want to change this ummah, then we, we will not be able to do it except that which changed the beginning of this ummah. I Meaning if we really care, we really, we really want the ummah to progress. Now we're Muslims living in the West and we care about Muslims in America. And we really want Muslims to be in a better state. Then we have to look at the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and how the companions did it. And it is in that that we're going to find uh, our, our ummah come to life. 
And the thing about the companions, like I mentioned, is that what they had and what is missing from, from our time is that, that attribute of going above and beyond uh, the bare minimum. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas, he says about the companions, he said, I did not see a single companion. He said, I did not see a single companion except that they would take something from the night. Meaning they would pray some type of Qiyam al-Layl. Rabi'ah he was one day with the Prophet وسلم, and he brought the Prophet some water for wudu. And the Prophet saw that this companion, he had, he had something on his mind. So he says to him, he says, Ya Rabi'ah, sal. He says, ask, ask what you want. He says, Ya Rasulullah, as'aluka murafaqatak fil jannah. He says, O Messenger of Allah, I ask for your companionship in paradise. And the Prophet says, Awa ghayra dhalik. He says, is there anything else that you want? He said, huwa dhak. He said, that's it. That's all I want. The Prophet said to him, fa'a'inni ala nafsik bi kathrat sujood He said, so help me help you by increasing in your sajda. Meaning if that's what you desire, you really desire from your life to be in paradise with the Prophet وسلم, that increase in this ibadah. Now the Prophet could have given some long drawn out answer and say you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to go here and do this and we need to fix the community and we need to establish this and do all these kind of things. But the Prophet told him one simple thing. He said increase in your sajda. Meaning get in touch with this prayer that Allah has given us. Our sila, our connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. If we cut that off, then how do we ever expect to become better Muslims? It's like a, a person who's in the hospital and they have an IV in them. And they pull it out and they expect to get better, or they expect to get fed. And that's just not going to happen. So if we, cut, if we cut that connection with Allah, meaning we stop praying, we stop seeking the help of Allah, then we're, we're never, there's no way to ever improve. There's no way to ever, ever get better. And one of the questions, one of the most off questions I get from young people is, you know what, my iman is just not doing too well. Like, I have a dip in my iman, and I just don't feel it anymore. Or a lot of times, people who start practicing Islam, they'll have this iman high, and they're doing really, really well, and then a time will come where, where they'll be like, you know, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. Or a lot of times, reverts and converts will say, when I first became Muslim, it was the most amazing experience of my life. And I want that back. I want that experience back. And one of the first questions I ask these people is, how is your connection with Allah? How is your qiyam al-layl? When was the last time you got up in the middle of the night or in the last third of the night to pray to your Lord? And if the answer, answer usually is, well, I don't, I don't really do that. I mean, I just try to do my five daily prayers. I'm just happy if I can get that in. And I tell them, I say, listen, if you're cutting off your connection with Allah, how are you going to get better? You can't expect your iman to just get fixed all of a sudden on its own. It's not going to happen. You have to take steps for you to become a better Muslim. You have to take steps to reach that level of iman. And this is why the companions, they were in a constant state of ibadah and worship to Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is why they reached the level that they reached in their, in their iman. It's because they never gave up. They were constantly worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. It is said by, uh, about uh, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala that his worship of the night was like this. He would pray, uh, sorry, this is Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He would pray Isha in the masjid and then he would pray his sunnah and then the, in the masjid they would put out a bed for him and he would sleep. He would sleep for a little while, and then he would get up and pray two rakahs, make wudu, get up, pray two rakahs of prayer. And then he would get tired and he would go back to sleep. And a little while later, he would get up and start praying again. And then he would get tired and he would go back to sleep. And it would continue like this until the last third of the night. And when the last third of the night would come, he would get up. And he would start praying. And he would pray two rakahs, and then two rakahs, and then two rakahs, and then two rakahs. He would keep praying until he thought Fajr is coming, coming in. And he would say to the companions, he would say, Asbahna. He say, has, has, have, has, the, has Fajr come in? Has the morning come in? And they would say, La ba'd. Like, you still have time. And he would keep praying. Until Fajr would come in. Until Fajr was about to come in, then he would pray one rak'ah of witr and end his night prayer. And you see, it is because of these type of things that the companions were, were at the level 
uh, that that they were they were at, and you compare that to the other side of the coin, the lifestyle of just being attached to this life and using your your night to serve your dunya instead of using your night to serve your akhirah. There's no success in that. So a lot of times, you know, one of the common things you see in, in our culture, in our society is people work nine to five jobs and they get the weekend off. So the weekend is meant to maximize fun because they spent their week working and they're tired and, you know, or they're going to school or whatever it is, they're, they're, they, they worked and now it's time to play. So they'll maximize their fun on the weekend. And they'll say, listen, I only have a couple hours. That's why you see a lot of people, they'll, they'll stay up in the night. And people who go, who go clubbing and stuff like that, they'll spend the whole night clubbing. Because they're using their night to benefit their dunya. When a believer uses their night to benefit their akhara. When it comes to Qiyam al-Layl, one of the advices I often give, and I give this advice because this was the advice given to me by my teachers, is if you want to pray Qiyam al-Layl, all you have to do is just try it. And I'm not talking about spending a third of the night praying or half of the night praying. I'm saying get up 10 minutes before Fajr. Just 10 minutes before Fajr. And we know the Prophet told us that it is the last third of the night where Allah comes down to the lowest parts of the heaven and he asks, he says, which one of my servants is seeking my forgiveness that I may forgive them? And which one of my servants is seeking my mercy that I may be merciful, merciful for them? Which one of my servants is asking of me that I may give to them? And that, that third of the night is still there in the last 10 minutes before Fajr. So all I'm saying is wake up 10 minutes before Fajr. Not an hour, not two hours before Fajr. 10 minutes before Fajr. And try and, and, and pray Qiyam layl And experience this amazing spiritual nature that... Allah Azza wa has given us this blessing that Allah Azza wa has given us. And when you get up in the night, number one, you'll see your heart transform. You'll feel your heart unlike you've ever felt it before. And I know a lot of us, and this is a problem which is very, very common, where we look at Islam and all we see is a bunch of things we have to do. And, and we're missing that spiritual side of Islam. We're missing that connection with Allah and our Creator. And I tell you that if you're seeking that connection, then get up and pray Qiyam al-Layl. You will see your heart transform. You will see this tranquility and peace that Islam is supposed to be. You know, people talk about Islam. Islam means peace and all that kind of stuff. If you will really want to experience that, get up in that last third of the night. Get up for 10 minutes and you will see that peace and tranquility descend upon you. Imam Hassan al-Basri was asked, they came to him and they said, why is it that the people who pray Qiyam al-Layl, they just seem different? Meaning compared to everyone else in the community, the Ahlu Qiyam al-Layl, the people of Qiyam al-Layl, are just different people. Why is it? Why is that the case? And Imam Hassan al-Basri, he said to them, he said, it's because these people, they secluded themselves with their Lord. Meaning they, they went in that time and they secluded themselves with their Lord. فَأَلْبَسَهُمْ بِنُورِهِ And Allah Azza wa Jal clothed these people with His nur the gift from Allah Azza wa Jal for these people who spent their nights in Qiyam layl or spent a portion of their nights in Qiyam layl Thabit al-Bunani rahimallah ta'ala one of the tabi'een he talks about himself and, and his journey with Qiyam layl he says I spent 20 years of my life trying to pray Qiyam layl and it was very difficult upon me he said I struggled every night with Qiyam layl I tried and tried and tried and, and you know, it was difficult for me he says, after those 20 years of Qiyam layl I spent another 20 years reaping the rewards of the first 20 years. Meaning it became easy for me to pray Qiyam layl And not only was it easy, he began to enjoy Qiyam layl Meaning Qiyam layl was now pleasurable to him. And this is why Qiyam layl is a thing that once you make it a habit, there will come a time where you will be sad if you miss Qiyam layl and that's, that's, that's the reward. That's what lies in Qiyam al And I know, I, know, I know it's difficult for us to, to imagine that right now. Meaning, imagine a time where we get up in the morning and we, and we have tears in our eyes because we were not able to get up for Qiyam al And I know that's hard to imagine. But I tell you, this was a lifestyle of the companions and, and, and the early generations. If they would miss a single night of Qiyam al 
they would get up and they would be in tears because they missed that amazing spiritual experience that lied before them. Allah Azza wa Jal says uh, about, about the early morning and about the companions, that they would sleep very little from the night. Very little. And in the time before Fajr, they would seek the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the methodology. This is the way of the believers. That we sleep, you know, a portion of the night, but the rest we devote to Allah Azza wa Jal. And in the, in the time before Fajr, they seek forgiveness. And I, subhanAllah, I, I ask you and I ask myself, when was the last time we got up before Fajr and we said, Astaghfirullah. When was the last time we did that? And I, I remember, subhanAllah, till this day, um, I, was in, I was in the University of Medina, as, as the Sheikh mentioned. And uh, when I was in Medina, one of the things the students would do is that we, that we would carpool to go pray Fajr in the Prophet ﷺ's masjid. So I used to live off campus, and sometimes I would drive to campus, pick up some friends, and we would drive to the Prophet ﷺ's masjid. Now, while leaving the masjid, uh, while leaving the university, Sometimes there were students standing outside because they knew somebody's going to the masjid, somebody's going to the Prophet's masjid and they'll get a ride. And we saw somebody standing outside, so I pulled over and I said, get in. It was one of the students. And we started driving to the masjid. <clears throat> now the masjid is about a 15-minute drive from the university. And I remember till this day, the brother who got in, throughout the whole ride, he said, first he said, Assalamu alaikum when he got in. And through the whole ride, he said, Astaghfirullah, 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 Astaghfirullah. For 15, 20 minutes, that whole ride, and this is obviously before Fajr, because you have to get to the Prophet ﷺ's masjid early before Fajr to be able to pray um, in a good spot. And then when we get to the Prophet ﷺ's masjid, we, we, we park, and before getting out, he says to us, he says, Ya ikhwan, ma bikum? He says, my brothers, what is wrong with, with you? He says, how come you do not seek, the, how come you do not make istighfar? He says, لِمَاذَا لَا تَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah." He said, why is it that you don't seek the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal? He says, haven't you heard Allah Azza wa Jal say, وَبِالْأَسْحَارِهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ That it is in that time, in the morning time, that they seek the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And it is at that moment that it hit me that I don't do that. I mean, I know for a fact there's people amongst us that we, we have been awake before Fajr at times. And I know it's going to happen because Ramadan's coming up and, you know, Fajr's really early now and I know people are going to be up during the night. Okay. But I realized at that moment that there, I've spent a lot of nights being, being up and being up before Fajr. But never did I seek the forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that brother, Jazallah Khair, he taught me a lesson. And later on, I actually found out that this brother, even before coming to the university, he was a scholar in his own country. I mean, before he ever stepped foot into the university, he was, he was a scholar. And that brother on that day taught me a lesson and may Allah Azza wa Jal reward him. So the companions, going back to the companions, you look at the lives of the companions and, and you see that the lives of the companions were not easy by any means. You know, and we tend to think that our lives are difficult, we're living in difficult times, and we're dealing with tests and trials and stuff like that. I assure you, no matter how hard we think our lives are, the lives of the companions were much harder. But the companions' lives were beautiful. They had something beautiful in their lives. And you have to think, there were companions that were tortured. There were companions that were killed in battle. There's companions that would lose a spouse because they died in, in, in battle or something like that. They went through immense tests and trials. But if you look at their lives, their lives were absolutely beautiful. And the question is how? How were their lives so beautiful? What did they have that we don't? And you see, it's the spiritual nature that they had that we're just missing. We just don't have that. And so we look at these tests and these trials and these hardships in life and we crumble and we, we're crushed and we can't move forward because we're missing that connection with Allah. We've never prayed Qiyamul Layl. We never tried that. We never, we never had that experience. And you know, one of the things that people often say, and you've probably heard this before, they say Islam is a religion of ease. Has anyone heard this before? Islam is a religion of ease. This comes from a hadith of the Prophet The Prophet said, Ad-Dinu Yusar. That the religion is ease. Now a lot of people will look at this hadith and they'll say, well, Islam is ease. So if I find something in Islam which is difficult, I don't really have to do it, right? Because Islam is ease. So if it's hard for me to pray the five daily prayers, if I said, I'm said, ad yusr, I don't have to do it. Now this is one understanding. The correct understanding 
is that Islam is by no means physically easy. Anyone who studied a little bit of Islam will tell you it's, Islam is not by any means physically easy. How many of us, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I will raise my hands, anyone will, will raise his hands. How many of us find it difficult to get up for Fajr on time every day? Me, right? Everyone does. So you're telling me now that this is easy? Of course not. Islam, we're going to go through tests and trials. And Islam will be difficult. So where is this ease? Where is this ease that, that the Prophet ﷺ is talking about? Ibn al-Qayyim ta'ala, when talking about this ayah, you know what he says? He says the ease of a mu'min is unlike any other ease. Because on the day when the sun is on top of our heads, and one day is 50,000 years long, and people are struggling, on that day a believer will have ease. On that day a believer will have ease. And I ask you, is there any ease more important than ease on that day? The ease that we have in this, in this, this life, this short life we have, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it is, compared to 50,000 years and an eternity in Akhirah. That is ease. That is true ease. Not ease in this life. And if you really want to speak about this life and you want to speak about ease in this life, I will tell you how Islam is ease in this life. Islam gives us something that is beyond physical ease. And that is the ease of our heart. The ease of peace and contentment in our heart. And this is why Islam doesn't promise you to be physically like at ease. Islam doesn't promise you you're not going to feel pain and hardship. But what Islam does promise you is that if you follow the commandments of Allah, if you submit yourself to Allah, if you submit yourself to the Sunnah of the Prophet then you will find ease in your heart. You will be content like the companions were content. You will go through tests and trials and you will be pushed and shoved, but your heart will be at ease. This is the ease that Islam promises us. And this is the ease that we will find in Qiyamul Layl. That we may be physically in pain. Physically, it may be difficult for us to get up and worship Allah Azza wa Jal. But once you try it, you will see that that peace and contentment is yusr. Ad-deenu yusr. Wallahi, the Prophet ﷺ spoke the truth when he said ad-deenu yusr. Indeed, certainly, the deen is yusr. And it really amazes me, subhanAllah, sometimes that there are people who have never experienced Qiyamul Layl. Apart from Ramadan, apart from that one month where everyone's praying Qiyam al-Layl, they don't know what Qiyam al-Layl is. It's like it's, it's not even part of the religion. It's something ajib, something strange for them. Like, what Qiyam al-Layl are you talking about? And I say to them, subhanAllah, how can a person live their whole life and they never experience Qiyam al-Layl, they never experience that beautiful moment that Allah has given us? That's very sad, Wallahi. And I feel sad for myself when I, if I don't pray Qiyam al-Layl. Because I'm missing out on that amazing opportunity. And then you think there's people who've never experienced that. There's Muslims, in, there's Muslims, there's communities full of people who have never experienced this gift from Allah Azza wa Jal. This beautiful time that Allah has given us, we haven't, we haven't uh, experienced that. So I say to you, Ramadan is coming up. A month where we know, the Prophet told us, the angels, uh, the uh, shayateen are chained up. What does that mean, the shayateen are chained up? What does that do for us if the shayateen are chained up? Does anyone know? How does that benefit us? In which way? How does that help us if the shayateen are chained up? Right, exactly. They don't tempt us. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing that we find is that it is easy to worship Allah in Ramadan. This is why you'll see that in the month of Ramadan, you'll find people in the masjid who have never been to the masjid. People who have never been to the masjid ever before, they'll be in masjid Ramadan. And you'll see someone who cannot get up for fajr, cannot pray their five daily prayers, you'll see them come to the masjid and stand for 20 rak'ahs of prayer. They'll stand for hours worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. Because this is the gift that Allah gave us in the month of Ramadan. He said, here, take this month, have this spiritual journey, and come out a better Muslim. So I say to you, the month of Ramadan is coming. Use this month. Use this month to make... Uh, Qiyam al-Layl, uh, a habit where we, adapt, where we adopt the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and change your life, change your spiritual nature, change your connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. One of the amazing things about Qiyam al-Layl is the aspect of seclusion. And in our society, everything is very public, especially now with Facebook and Twitter and my Twitter page and YouTube, everything is public now. And we almost don't have a, a private life. And that's 
kind of sad in a way. Because we're missing out on so much good and we're missing out on this personal time. And Qiyam al gives that back to us. When everyone else is sleeping, passed out, snoring, the lights are off and everything, we get up and we pray to Allah when nobody else is watching. And I tell you, there is almost nothing else that will give you that charge of Iman back. That ikhlas, that sincerity in your worship, if you're seeking it, get up for Qiyam al And when you get up, you'll realize, there's no one watching me right now. There's no one here to impress, there's nothing. There's, hatta, this isn't even wajib upon me, it's not fard upon me, it's not mandatory upon me to get up and pray. But I'm doing it. Why? Tell me any other reason why you would do that. Why would somebody get up for Qiyam al Oh my God, I'm To get closer to Allah. That is the only reason. That is the only reason somebody will get up for Qiyam al That's it. So if you find yourself getting up for Qiyam al you know you're working on your sincerity. You know you're building your connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza says, تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَلِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ That those who, they abandon their beds, they forsake their, bed, their beds. And they call out to their Lord, خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا in, 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 in fear and hope. Meaning this is, this is the, the, the feelings going through, our, uh, going, through our, going through us at night. We're fearful of the punishment of Allah and we're hopeful for the reward. And from what Allah has given them, they spend. And then the next ayah says, فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ عَيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ That nobody knows what has been hidden from them, from the joys. جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ As a reward for what they did. So you know what the scholars say about these ayahs? They say this is an example of al jazau min jins al-amal. That the reward is given according to the act. So because these people, they forsake, they, they forsake their beds, they got up and they abandoned their beds in a time when nobody is looking. They're hidden from everyone. What is their reward? What did the next ayah say? They're given a reward which nobody has seen. And this reward is special for them. Nobody can imagine this reward. It is because they forsake their beds and they left everything and they got up in seclusion to Allah. There's nothing else there. There's no one else there. And Allah Azza wa gives them this reward. This, this reward that nobody can imagine. As a reward for what they did. And the Prophet said that the, that the example of, of the night prayer to the day prayer is like the example of a person giving charity in public and a person hiding their charity. The seclusion, the, 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 the satisfaction you feel in your heart when you know you're not doing it for anyone but Allah Azza wa Jal. That is the night prayer, that is the, the training that the night prayer gives us. And inshallah I'm going to end with one last thought and that is this. If you're having any type of problem in your life, any type of problem, the answer lies in Qiyam layl The answer lies in Qiyam layl If a person, a believer is trying to repent to Allah, they're trying to turn a new leaf, then their answer lies in Qiyam layl Their sanctuary is Qiyam layl the night prayer. If a, if a believer is fearful about their soul, and this is a lot of us where we fear for our souls that we're about to fall into some type of sin, we're about to be tempted or tested or tried, pray Qiyam al The answer is in Qiyam al If you want to build for your Akhirah, if you want to, you know, uh, build and, and establish your, your Akhirah, so that when you show up on the Day of Judgment, you're successful, look for the provisions in Qiyam al and that's what the Qiyam al has to offer you. This is what the night prayer has to offer you. Now, before ending, and I know I just, alhamdulillah, I hope we're all like encouraged and charged up to pray Qiyam al I wanted to give you seven tips that will help you pray Qiyam al-Layl, inshaAllah ta'ala. Number one is to not go all out when praying Qiyam al And I know that may sound counterproductive, counterproductive but hear me out a little bit. I'm hoping now, inshallah, that all of us today will go home and pray Qiyam al layl inshallah ta'ala, right? Yes? Inshallah. Now, we're, we will be tempted to get up and pray like an hour of Qiyam al layl or two hours of Qiyam al layl because we're charged up and we're really excited about praying Qiyam al layl and you want to experience that spiritual time that I talked about. But I tell you to take it easy. That get up for five or ten minutes. But get up for a time that you can be consistent with. 
the Prophet وسلم, said, okay. That the most beloved actions to Allah are those actions done consistently, even if they're less. Meaning it is better for us to pray five minutes of Qiyam al-Layl for the rest of our lives than to get up and pray two hours tonight, tomorrow we pray an hour, and then nothing after that. If we're consistent with this, that will help us pray Qiyam al-Layl. So keep it small. If you, if you can get up and pray two hours for the rest of your life and you know that, Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Uh, tip number two. Make the intention to pray Qiyam al-Layl before you go to bed. Now this is, one of the, this is one of the amazing things that the, that the Prophet ﷺ, it's like, a, it's like a, uh, one of the, the tips that the Prophet ﷺ actually gives. It's not my tip, this is the tip of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said that a person who goes to bed <coughs> with the intention to pray Qiyam al meaning before going to bed, they said, inshallah, tonight I'm going to pray Qiyam al And they set their alarm and all that stuff. And they wake up in the morning and they realize Fajr is already in. And they missed Qiyam al The Prophet ﷺ said this person will not only get the reward for Qiyam al but they will also, this sleep will be a sadaqah for them, will be a charity from Allah. Meaning they will have a blessed sleep. They will have barakah in their sleep. So if you made the intention and you got up in the morning, it's like a win-win situation. Alhamdulillah, if you made the intention and you woke up, you got to pray Qiyam al-Layl. That's awesome. If you, got, if you made the intention and you didn't wake up, you get the reward for Qiyam al-Layl. So that's tip number two. Tip number three is tell someone that you're going to wake them up for Fajr, for Qiyam al-Layl. So call up one of your friends or a family member. I'll tell them, listen, I got you tonight. Don't worry about it. I'll wake you up. You tell them, I will wake you up for Qiyam al-Layl. Insha'Allah ta'ala. And you know what this is going to do? This is going to force you to get up because now you're responsible for somebody else. <laughs> you're responsible to wake someone else up. And here's the thing, right? It's not just you're responsible. If you manage to get up, insha'Allah ta'ala, you are maximizing your reward. Because not only are you waking yourself up for Qiyam al-Layl, you're waking somebody else up. And you will be rewarded for, the act, for, for their action. As the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ سَنَّ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ سُنَّةً حَسَنًا فَلَهُ أَجْرُهَا وَأَجْرُ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ The person who starts a good sunnah, something good, meaning encourages someone else in a good deed, they will have the reward of their own action and the, and the reward of the others who followed in that action until the day of judgment. Can you imagine you got up tonight and you called somebody and you said, listen, get up for Qiyam al-Layl. And this person now, because of that one phone call, they started praying Qiyam al-Layl for the rest of their life. And you maybe, khalas, this is the only night you prayed Qiyam al-Layl. You never prayed Qiyam al-Layl again. This is the only night. Khalas, you're like, okay, I can't do this. Forget this. But they managed to pray Qiyam al-Layl for the rest of their lives. Now you're getting reward for all of their Qiyam al-Layl. I mean, that's just amazing. And imagine that they woke up somebody else and the reward continues for you until the end. Number four, go to sleep early. And I know this is something that, you know, we kind of abandon and we don't really think about sleeping early. But I tell you that the Prophet ﷺ would dislike staying up after Isha. And I'm not saying, listen, pray Isha, go to bed 10 minutes later. Because the Prophet ﷺ would sometimes delay his Isha prayer. I'm saying, go to sleep at a reasonable hour. And make the intention that you're doing this not to, just to get rest, but to pray Qiyam al-Layl. And you'll see your sleep will be, have barakah in it. It'll be a blessed sleep. Number five. Um, don't be too comfortable when you go to bed. And at the same time, don't be too uncomfortable. And I know uh, we're tempted in this day and age to buy like the fluffiest, nicest mattress we can possibly find. And that's, all, that's cool, and you know, that's, we hope that that will give us better sleep, but actually, in actuality, it doesn't really give us better sleep. And the thing is, if we're too comfortable, we're not going to be too likely to wake up. And so this is why you'll see people now, they'll go to the other side and they'll say, listen, um, sleep on the floor. And I know people will say, you know what, I'm just going to sleep on the floor because I'm going to implement the Sunnah of the Prophet and I'm going to sleep on the floor, and I'm going to have, I'm going to get up for Qiyam al-Layl. What usually ends up happening is, people don't get restful sleep, and they get overly tired. So if they manage to get up for Qiyam al-Layl, it's like this weird experience where they're tired and this and that. And so I say, listen, find a bed which isn't too comfortable and find a find bed that isn't too comfortable either. So something in the middle. And as we know, the bed of the Prophet ﷺ was made out of uh, date palm leaves to the point when the Prophet ﷺ, when he would get up, he would have marks on his back, sallallahu alayhi wa Number six, uh, and I know I'm short on time, right? 
You good? I heard the adhan from somewhere. Was it somebody's phone? Okay. Alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so number six, uh, go to sleep in a state of tahara, in a state of purity. And this was the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and he instructed us to encourage us to go to sleep uh, in a state of tahara. And you'll find that if you sleep uh, in a state of wudu, you're doing a couple things. Number one, you're reminding yourself of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu so you're saying, listen, I'm implementing the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ before going to bed. And this will cause you to have barakah in your sleep. And that, you know, the issue of barakah, and I could give a whole talk on the issue of barakah, it's very important, uh, infusing barakah in our, in our actions. Because you can have two people, they both slept two hours, and one person has no barakah in his sleep, and he'll get up and he'll be tired. But this other person has slept two hours, they had barakah, they had blessings in their sleep, so this two hours was like the most amazing sleep they had. So, one of the ways to infuse barakah in our lives and in our sleep is to implement the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So, take the sunnah and, and apply it. That's number six. My last tip, inshallah, and I'm going to end with this, is try not to eat and drink too much. And that's, what, that's one of the things that Ramadan helps us do. Alhamdulillah, even though I know there's people who fill up before going to bed in Ramadan, the uh, exact opposite of what we're supposed to be doing uh, in Ramadan. I know right now it's not really a problem. We, I hope we're all pretty good with not eating too much before going to bed. But the issue really comes up in Ramadan where people, they haven't eaten all day, so they'll like eat a lot and it'll be really difficult for them to get up. And even if they get up, they're going to be uncomfortable. So that's my last piece of advice, inshallah. And I'll end with that. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll take them now, inshallah. Allah ta'ala alam. If you have missed your fard prayer, can you make the intention for Qiyam al-Layl? Okay, if you've missed your fard prayer, before... Previous fault prayer? Well, it depends. Uh, if it's uh, a fault prayer which you missed a day or two ago, then you make up that fault prayer as soon as you can. But if it's like uh, five years ago, I didn't pray, whatever, then inshallah, you make tawbah from that. You seek Allah's forgiveness, and inshallah, it just doesn't, has no effect on your, your other deeds, inshallah. Allah Adam. No, go ahead. Tayyib, it doesn't make a difference, Annie. Tayyib, the question is uh, if you pray witr, Right? Uh, does your salah after that, is it considered Qiyam al-Layl or not? Sah? Anything you pray at night time is Qiyam. After, 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 طبعًا, after uh, your Isha prayer and your Sunnah Ratiba, your Sunnah of Isha, any prayer you pray in the night is considered Qiyam al-Layl because you're getting up in the night and praying. But obviously, Ahsan Waqt, the best time to pray Qiyam al-Layl is what? The last third of the night. No. Which is, Allah alam what time it is over here. <laughs> Naam, Allah alam. Anything else? Witr is also considered Qiyam al yes. Naam. Anything else? Naam, the question is, Taraweeh considered Qiyam al What do you all think? Yes, it's considered Qiyam al Naam. Anything else? No? Khalas, the question is, uh, if you want to pray Qiyam al but you're afraid that you won't be able to get up. Uh, in this case, uh, are you speaking about witr specifically or just any qiyam al-layl? Okay, if you are, are afraid that you won't get up for qiyam al-layl, uh, you can pray qiyam after isha. So before going to bed, you pray some time of qiyam, and then you go to bed with the intention, I will try to get up and pray qiyam al-layl um, in the morning, in before fajr. So if you're able to do that, alhamdulillah, nurun ala nur, you pray two times, you pray qiyam al-layl. But you can pray it before going to bed with the intention. No, Allah Adam. Of course, of course. You can, like I said, as long as it's before Fajr, it's considered the last third of the night. And that is the most Mubarak time to pray. That is the most blessed time to pray. As Allah descends to the uh, lowest part of the heavens to, to answer our dua and our, what we're asking for. Naam, hold on. Could it be a group, Qiyam al layl it's best to pray a group Qiyam al-Layl in Ramadan only, to leave it to Ramadan only. Naam. Allah alam. Okay, if you, uh, if you pray your witr before going to bed, um, the Prophet said that make your last prayer of the night the witr. Uh, so it is best to pray it uh, the last thing in the night. But if you fear that you won't be able to get up, or there's a good chance that you won't get up, you can pray your witr before going to bed. Uh, but if you wake up for Qiyam al-Layl, you just pray Qiyam al-Layl, you pray the Hajjud,